Hi, I'm Izzy Barrett and I'm the Artistic Director of the National Youth Jazz Collective. Welcome to today's hashtag National Youth Jazz Wednesday uh, and it's our usual weekly live stream where we get together with uh, partners and uh, jazz musicians, people on the music scene in the, in the industry, talking to some of the young musicians that we work with. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of that of this without our very dear programme manager, Nick Brown. So Nick, come and say hello to everybody. I've been talking non-stop since nine o'clock this morning and for a few seconds there, I suddenly forgot how to talk. <laughs> I think you're quite allowed to uh, allowed to forget how to talk. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's really great to be back here on Wednesday for Hashtag Nash Youth Jazz Wednesday. And you've been busily doing the last bit of promo for the revised audition date. So we've gone to, is it, what's the deadline date now for submission? The deadline date for submission now is the 23rd of April. Uh, so we've got just over a month to get your applications in. And there are limited uh, spaces remaining in, in various regions around the country that we'll be visiting on our audition tour, which will be happening from the 16th of uh, April, no, 16th of May, um, all the way up until uh, the first couple of weeks of June. Um, so we've got kind of a month period where we're auditioning around the half-term holiday. So I think we've got a few weekends and then because normally we do two weeks for auditions, we're trying to shoehorn that into one week of half-term. So that's meant that the places that are nearest to London we're doing at weekends so that we can travel there and back which is really exciting and I can't believe I'm actually going to hear people play live it's going to be amazing can't wait to see everybody and obviously we've been doing a lot of uh, preparation for the Covid side of things about how people will arrive and sort of taking temperatures with thermometers and the spacing and all of that because as you've said so beautifully in the promo in the revised promo we really want to make sure that everybody feels safe and comfortable and you and I will be getting on and off trains going from city to city, reconnecting two years it is since we saw, because we couldn't do it last year. So it's two years and I've really missed everybody. I don't know about you, Nick. Yeah, definitely. And and just to get outside and like you say, see all of these musicians and meet them. Um, some that we know, some that are, are new to us. It's just going to be really special to be able to do that again. So the one thing that we weren't able to do this year, we like to do some workshops as we go around as well, but we just felt with all the COVID side of things, it was probably one step too far just for this year. So it, it will literally be an audition tour without any workshops, but from next Easter onwards, they'll be put back in again. And then to remind everybody about the summer school dates, 22nd to the 28th of August, and that we do regional work while we're there as well. So any young musicians living in the Midlands that would like to come and join us, or if you want to travel further afield, uh, definitely the 24th and the 25th, those will be the outreach days. Um, and those that have passed the auditions will come and work with us 22nd to the 29th, 28th. So one of our guests um, that we're going to talk to later on actually came and joined the summer school. So we'll, we can ask him about his time there. But in the first bit of the interview, we're going to welcome a really dear friend. And I'd actually like you to welcome her because you don't, it's normally me doing all of this. And you've got such a strong connection with Judith as well. And maybe how you first met her as well and came across her. And, and and then we're introduced back to MIJC again through. So might you welcome our first guest? Yes, so so uh, Judith Robinson is our guest from Sound of Music, um, who actually, I think I first met on MIJC Summer School. She was working as um, kind of the program manager or whatever the role was back then uh, for the summer school. And then we kind of re-met whilst I was working at the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group on their learning traineeship. and. I remember being in, uh, I think we we're driving to the train station or something like that after a project and just talking and kind of making a connection that that was Judith Robinson from NYJC and I was Nick Brown, one of the uh, participants of the summer school that year. So it was really great. And then Judith put me back in touch with NYJC, um, which was amazing. And here we are today. So this is Judith Robinson. From Sound of Music. Come and join us, Judith. Hello, it's really nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me and really nice to be reminded. I remember that car journey very well, Nick. You were, we've been out in some school in the in the depths of Birmingham and we were yeah, heading back to the station to travel home again. And the, when you were with the NYJC, it was director of uh, uh, fun, the fundraising income generation and operations. So we were co-directors together. That's working. right. And that was when Nick when we were in East Anglia, when Nick was one of the students on the East Anglia course. 
So hello, Judith. It's great to see you. And um, I'm sure like everybody else, even though we're pretty stationary physically, we're all staying at home. We've been whizzing around from pillar to post. So what's, what's your day been like? What's it involved today at Sound of Music? Oh, blimey. Well, obviously, I'm at home. Um, I've spent all morning working on an enormous spreadsheet because I'm putting in a proposal to Youth Music for quite a large amount of money. And in return for a large amount of money, they expect a lot of information. I know you're familiar with that kind of thing. So that was this morning. Um, and then I did a bit of publicity for the summer school that I run, Sound and Music Summer School. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a bit anyway. Um, so, yeah, just a few reminding emails and, and so on. And then um, I've actually just had um, the very first steering group meeting of a new initiative that I'm working on. Um, which is to create an alliance for composing and music education. Oh, great. So, yes. So I've been in Zoom quite a lot today. Well, thanks for joining us again to, now after all those sessions. And I hope that because we're going to be listening to a bit of music and sort of talking about the creative side of things. So I hope that you can we could park up our Excel spreadsheets and then mm. talk about it from a creative side. And obviously, as you and I know, those Excel spreadsheets are incredibly important as facilitating tools. But um, this is the end product that we're going to be talking about now. So the 2007 is when NYJC started its summer school. And uh, but, uh, not long after we started that first summer school, I remember getting a phone call about an initiative that you were setting up and you very kindly invited me to be one of the key tutors. So what is the Sound and Music Summer School? Yeah, well, Sound and Music Summer School. Well, Sound and Music, let's start with Sound and Music. Sound and Music, um, we're a national organisation and we get funded by the Arts Council and we exist to support the creation and enjoyment of new music. And new music can be any kind of music you like. We're not genre specific at all. Um, and within Sound and Music, I'm head of education, so I look, look after all the activity with young people and also anything to do with, with how they get supported. So it might be their teachers and their educators and the kind of the music education infrastructure. Um, so in its very early days, Sound and Music um, wanted to set up a sort of national scheme so that young composers from across the country could come together and, and just have the most amazing week of creativity. Um, we have 75 young people and we hold it at the Purcell School, which is, um, somebody's called it Hogwarts for young musicians. I mean, it's, you know, it's a big old school. It's got fantastic facilities. There are even pianos in some of the bedrooms. Um, and we wanted to acknowledge that young people and composers all create music in lots of different ways. And of course, one of the ways that they do that is through jazz. Uh, very important and creative genre. So. It's like, you know, no brainer. Who do I ask? I ask Izzy to come and lead that jazz tutor group. So about a fifth of the students who come to be with us for the week. And there's about usually 70 to 75 young people. So um, a good number of those will come and be in the jazz group for the week. They'll um, you come in, you're in the jazz group and you focus on writing. It's usually sex test, isn't it? There's a rhythm section and 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 horns and, and you get opportunity to meet all those musicians and collaborate with them and they all come back at the end of the week and sort of record and perform the piece but you do as a musician you also get to have a go with all the other tutor groups so you get to see what composing for voice is like you get a little go at making you know writing something that gets dubbed onto film um, and we have all sorts of visitors as well we might um, we've had people like Orphe Robinson came and did some sort of live creative creative orchestra work one one year and we've had um the master of the queen's music judith weir has come and talked to us a few times actually because she's our patron so lots of sort of exciting additional things as well as as well as the core work of writing a, a new jazz piece you've um, you often invite some guest people to come and do some work in the evenings have are any of those people booked now so that you can announce them or is it a to be continued it's a watch this space yeah. all will be revealed but i actually i have got an exciting announcement which is because historically we've always had five tutor groups um and this year we, we've been doing a bit of youth, youth consultation we've been asking um people who come on the summer school but also young people who don't come on the summer school we've been saying well what other kinds of music making do you like doing as well as the types that we have on offer and the thing that everybody has said is oh i want to make music electronically 
So we're going to have a sixth group, and that will be an electronic music group. And again, it won't be necessarily that genre specific. It will be, um, you know, it might be that you go and collect found sounds and make, work with those, or it might be that you're really into some kind of hardcore logic loops and, and stuff that is beyond my expertise, let's say. Um, who knows? But um, there'll be a chance to do that kind of stuff as well this year. Brilliant. So um, during the, I think to begin with, that was sort of quite early on what was happening educationally, but then obviously there's a gap between each summer school of many months. And now I see that there are lots of other initiatives that have sprung up during the year that you've been really steering nationally to do with composition. So I wondered whether you might share with us, what is it that you do? Obviously the summer school itself, the run up to it, it, it takes up a lot of time. But um, incredibly, there are other things that you've also been setting up, other initiatives. Wondered if you might share with us a bit about yeah, that. Yeah, well. definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's it's I suppose I've had to think quite hard. You know, it's 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 me at Sound of Music. And then there's a I have a the, there's an education coordinator as well. And there's a whole team of people who do marketing and, and artist development. You know, it's, it's quite a wide ranging organisation, but people you, we have to think quite carefully because we're a small organisation. So how can you make the biggest impact when you're funded to be a national organisation? Um, but there aren't many of you because my dream, my instinct would be to actually set up projects all over the country. Um, and I know this is something that is that we hold in common with NYJC. Actually, we know that there isn't that national infrastructure for young musicians who are more creative in their approach to music making let's say so those people who compose their own music what you know whether it's singer songwriting composing or or notated classical composing doesn't matter or if you're an improviser there isn't that net network if you play the cello you play in your school orchestra and you go to county youth orchestra and you might get into the national youth orchestra and there's a kind of well understood pathway but it just doesn't exist so um my instinct would be to set up lots and lots of projects in every town everywhere in the country but I don't have the money or the energy to do that myself so one thing that we are just starting out on and actually at my steering group today that was our first meeting but we're going to have a national network a sort of an alliance of organizations working we all we can do is work we're going to have to work together nationally to sort of get this going um, and I think there's probably all sorts of things that we're going to have to do. And it's not just about setting up those opportunities. It's things like making sure that people know that they're happening. So actually having a website where you can actually find out what's happening in your area, which could be um, could be all sorts of creative. You know, it can include jazz and improvisational workshops, I think, as well as composing. And the, I mean, and, and this has to extend not only to the young people and for parents just to find out about, um, but things like CPD for teachers, so professional development. Because one of the other things I've noticed is that teachers in schools especially are not very confident about teaching the, the composition bit of the curriculum. You know, and, and you'll find that pupils in, in, the, in music classes, they'll be having instrumental lessons. The ones that are doing GCSE and A-level anyway will be having instrumental lessons. So that's kind of covered. And the teacher is comfortable teaching about the music that they need to know about for the curriculum. But then actually doing that practical composing activity and the improvising activity in the classroom is, is where teachers find it more difficult. And I understand that, you know, that's that's the training I had as well um, so another thing that Sound of Music does through a number of different sort of projects we've, we've got sort of future training programs going we, we do online sessions we've got a master's accredited course for the teachers who want to really deepen their practice and we're about to start a primary school initiative as well um, so yeah that keeps me quite busy actually <laughs> What's really, um, what's really lovely about what you've just explained and i think it's true of our partners at the um it's english folk dance society and millop fest as well the indian musicians we work with is that the, the, you're all also then working with people within the profession you know your your remit as an organization is bigger than the educational stuff myjc is exclusively just focusing on working with the you know the feeder into the conservatoire level although we've got some exciting things that i'll tell you about shortly to do with the alumni because we're being 15 next year it's our 15th birthday so and um, we'll share some of those ideas and it'd be nice to share it with our guests as well as the people watching but um 
one of the things about all of that is I completely forgot what I was just saying. What, what did you say just a couple of seconds ago? That, um, oh yes, with the teachers and everybody that you've been talking about yeah. and, and wider organisation. Sorry, it's the COVID, long COVID every now and again steps in and just takes away half a sentence. So with working um, within a bigger organisation that you can really see, you can see the progression of the youngsters and you still see them further on into the profession because they're still doing sound and music initiatives. I wondered if you might say a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, yes, so we started in 2009. So we are now into year 13, I think. I think that's right. Um, yeah, and people who did the course years ago pop up all over the place so um i'm just trying to think of some examples there's there's somebody called lily harris who came in about 2011 i think who is now in her late 20s and she's really you know she she's sort of emerging as a, a really respected composer um and i get people popping up at you know people are now trained teachers so they pop up in teacher training sessions that i run um yeah, it's really, really nice to see how people are progressing. And there was somebody, wasn't there somebody from a record label or something to do with... That's right, yeah, somebody yeah. got a job at Warner's. As um, one of those people, she sort of knows the catalogue at Warner's and she sort of places them for adverts and films and that kind of thing. That's a great job, because all of that, yeah, because that, that, that's a new trend now, isn't it, where people actually don't commission people to write for adverts, but they actually take current pieces. Yeah. That would be quite an exciting you know role to have. Um, yeah and um one last example actually it's really nice when he came to the, he was in the jazz group ollie uh oh, vibrant yeah. you remember yeah. he's uh doing a lot of work for film and radio now and theater yeah, yeah. He's, been yeah really he's doing really well and he actually came and did myjc he did the summer school one year i think he did as sound of music he was with us twice and then he did come and do the summer school um when we were in ascot and, um, and and then he has he's come to a few things that we've done since where Mick Foster and myself have run into him and had a chance to hear about what he's doing. Yeah, it's great, isn't it, how that the radio side of things particularly. Um, and he's still got that fantastically dry sense of humour, which has you know, fits of laughter within a few seconds. It's brilliant. I love it. So who are the other tutors that are leading this year's summer school? Who are the other people for the other groups? Um Right. Well, let's let's do some name checking then. So uh, David Horn is leading advanced instrumental composition. Uh, Laura Bowler is doing composing for voice. Uh, Aidan Gertzie, who is head of music technology at Purcell School, he is leading the film group. Alison Cox, who's head of composition at the Purcell School, is doing cross-cultural composition in collaboration with Paul Jitt, Bamra who's a phenomenal tabla player. And then the electronic composer we haven't actually identified yet. We're still shortlisting people. And every year <laughs> it's happened so that, you know, we've always got things to catch up And Kuljit has been working away over the years. And last year he announced, the, was it the publishing of the notation book? He's come up with some notation. Yeah, yeah. that's right. He, um, I think it was through Sound and Music um, was formed out of a number of organisations, including um, Society for Promotion of New Music, SPNM, and um, a project. He was a, an artistic director for it was a sort of, you know, you, you had an artistic director in each year kind of thing. So he was artistic director one year and he did a project where he worked with Western percussionists and tabla players and they invented a notation system. And he's used that every year at the summer school since, and it's now been published and there are manuals on how to use it. And I think it's even a, it's even a sort of plugin on the new Dorico composition software. Um, so yes, it's, it's uh, yeah, yeah. And he's also uh, worked with a company to invent an electronic tablet. So, you know, like you have an electronic drum kit and you can just play it and wear headphones. And there's a tablet now as well. And meanwhile, we've been writing the music for, um, is it Bend It Like Beckham, the musical? He did Bend It Like Beckham, uh, the musical, yes. And I'm just, he's just had something on Radio 3, which was a piece for tabla and orchestra, which oh, the BBC Con Concert Orchestra has played. It was on last weekend. So every year, that's one of the nice things about coming to the summer school, as well as meeting the amazing young musicians, really enjoying that shared journey. Everyone's always been up to stuff during the year and there's all that catching up and sharing of ideas. 
So, um, but I could imagine that there are some people who actually are composing in isolation and maybe don't know, it's that lovely term that a lot of the NIMOs are using at the moment, a community of shared interest. And uh, they yeah. might not have actually met any other young musicians, young composers that are interested in, and, you know, might be a bit shy about coming to join the community. So, and I know from being part of it that that's something that isn't, you know, there's no need to worry, but obviously people don't know that till they've tried it. So might you give a bit of an insight into what the community is like when we get there? Definitely. I would say, I mean, 75 people sounds a lot, but actually I'd say it's a really welcoming and inclusive place. So um, I suppose the nice thing is it's not like a youth orchestra where you turn up every week and you know each other. So if you were new, you'd feel left out and a bit of a lemon possibly. Um, nobody knows each other really. So you're all coming together for the same, you know, you're all into the same thing. You're all into music, you're all into composing and um, you're just there for that reason. Um, and although there are 14 to 18 year olds, then everybody supports everybody. So the older ones can sort of support the younger ones and the ones who came last year remember where the dining room is and we'll show everybody else. It's, it is a re really nice vibe. And then we've also got <coughs> chaperones that are looking after their well-being as well. Yeah, we've got a whole pastoral team who are really lovely, really supportive. And one of the nice things is because sometimes you can things can be overwhelming and as musicians we are sort of often sensitive to sound and noise around us and you know if we're really accommodating for anyone who's got any special requests so some people if they find that eating in a canteen is just too noisy and chaotic there's the opportunity to take their meal elsewhere and all those types of things to walk around the grounds as well yeah absolutely yeah um we've got quite a lot of experience now of working with neurodiverse people for example um yeah and and also uh we can support people who have any mobility needs we've we have had a couple of pe blind people come and we've got resources in braille already um so and then the other thing is if you need financial support to come we're really generous with bursaries um, we would never turn anybody away because um you know because they couldn't afford it because their family is on a lower income than average kind of thing so, um, yeah, I guess if you're interested, get in touch. Just say what support you need and we'll we'll work with you. And the, I think also yeah. there was a scribe on one year when we had somebody that came and helped with the notation side of things, which is great. And then we also, you know, um, the thing about using Sibelius and all the different softwares as well, because, you know, how, how do we capture the... I think we're generating parts for uh, NYJ for the jazz side of things. So uh, written parts for the sextet. Well, is that true for the other groups? Do they work in different ways? How do they create the compositions? Yeah, I'd say if being able to read music probably helps, um, being able to read and write it. But um, different groups work in different ways. So if you're a singer songwriter, we would put you in the writing for voice group, and they um, and you could just you know, you could notate your music differently if you if that's the way you work or, or somebody will support you to put it down as notation so that the singers can read it, you know. Um, and then certainly the cross-cultural group, they will work off graphic. I think a couple of groups would work off a graphic score if you were up for writing a graphic score. I know Alison's group, definitely, they firmly encourage it and they quite often make graphic scores as part, you know, during the week to have a go and, and sort of learn a bit more about them. And obviously the electronic group will be electronic. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. By sitting there with their bassoon saying, I'd like to be electronic, please. <laughs> I know a great electronic bassoon piece by Anna Meredith. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm wondering also about um, access to laptops and software as well, because there, we have had some students who couldn't bring a laptop with them. And so there is provision for that as well. There is. I mean, it's, we can't 100 percent guarantee a dedicated computer for everybody. But the, um, the school has got there are two classrooms with computers and then there's another I sort of technology suite that again has uh, computers right around the room I can't remember like 10 or 15 computers each one with Sibelius so when you sort of think there are three rooms with computers in and then a lot of people do bring their own then they, it, it works works itself out yeah it works and itself. then finally 
we've even got people that are working with us um, who can help with the parts and the scores. Might might you explain about the additional member of of staff? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yes. I mean, obviously everybody's working on their own piece, but but you know, creating that finished sort of thing of a score and parts is quite is quite technical, and we we, we understand if if you've not done that before. So. Yeah, there are people within the tutor groups who can, can kind of help with that and help you sort of set it out so that when the musicians come to perform from it, um, it all works nice and smoothly. And what's the goal? So I turn up on the Sunday of the, of the summer school. What are the dates again? Oh, well, I was going to, yes, there's a couple of sort of technical things I was going to mention. So the dates are not the same as NYJC summer school, I'm happy to say. <laughs> they are the 1st to the 7th of um august um yeah so that's that's when they are and the deadline for applying because you have to i mean you don't have to audition in the way you do for in yjc but you need to send us some information about you and show us an example and the deadline is actually really soon it's the 6th of april um and you have to go to the sound and music website i think i get sent nick um a little slide that he might be able to do a share screen at the end of this Perhaps at the end of the conversation we can bring it. If not, I think I've got it on my computer as well. Anyway, the sound, sound and music is soundandmusic.org. That's our website. And I'm sure if you go there, you'll find Summer School. And you apply from that. You send in all the information from a link on that site. Um, and you can get in touch with us. Uh, and we are education at soundandmusic.org. And we can answer any questions you've got. So maybe yeah, in a couple of minutes when I've just got a couple more questions about it all and then just before we bring our first uh, guest to join us, then we'll just say to Nick, can you just show that slide because that'd be lovely. So before we do that, um, so there I am, I turn up on the Sunday, uh, I'm, a, I'm a student and I've signed up and I don't know if I'm going to know anybody, I've been put in the group. So even though I'm going to be wake, working most of the week with one group, so the 15 that work with us in jazz i will actually get the opportunity to go around during some part of the week to work with all the other tutors and so uh, that's yeah. nice that you get the opportunity to do that but um just wondering what is the what what am i what, wanting to achieve what's the end game well the aim of the week is to create your own piece of music which will get recorded so that you've got your own recording and also it will get performed in a in a one of the many concerts that happen at the end of the week. So the way that we structure it is they, they tend to work Sunday to Wednesday evenings composing and then Thursday's the day that we get the uh, the sextet in and we rehearse the pieces because it's, I think it's really important, I'm sure you agree, Judith, especially for the jazz when you're including improvisation, it's really important to hear what you've written and then you it will it'll whisper some ideas of how you can free things up or ideas that you might not have had because how to stimulate the improvisation and, and often the students haven't done much of that putting jazz musicians in the context of their writing and asking them to improvise so they can see that they could even maybe either it's too much they've overwritten and they need to give them more space or you know you could push the bracket a bit so there's that nice flexible little bit of revision time after the rehearsal and Friday we're in we record them each of the tracks so uh, how do you share those with everybody afterwards do they get a a, a group uh, CD or are they links? We send it out by WeTransfer these days. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. And then Friday evening we do a live performance. So, and that's I think yeah. that's really important for the young musicians because it's a hugely different. And we'll ask our guests in a minute how that felt with their pieces. Hugely different between being in a studio and recording, and then sort of having the audience, the presence of the audience. And it's the first time that the whole group get to hear each other's as well, because they don't come That's in right. to the recording. And, yeah. it, and it, I, there's that lovely sort of moment of, um, you don't know what's coming next, because they sort of, they feel a little, sometimes like a little bit, oh, is that it? After the recording, it feels a little bit deflated. And then the gigs later on that day, and there they are with suddenly this big <laughs> audience and everybody's cheering each other and they're announcing their pieces and it and that is the reality of the performance world that sometimes you're in a studio where you are just playing to each other as musicians and then other times you're out there playing live so when the guests join it'd be interesting to see because they had that experience of recording a piece and having it played live and if there was a sort of a uh, an epiphany moment um, with the relationship of their piece we we as players 
feel that we can open things up a lot more during the performance as well. Whereas mm. uh, things when we're recording for the studio, everybody's expecting perfection. So um, kind of we to give that perfection, we've got to kind of rein it in. So for example, we can't give a trump, we can't open it up for a trumpet solo and say, could you play 12 choruses? Just in case then it's like, oh, could I have another two takes? Whereas the gig, you know, you just got one play of the piece. So maybe if we could share that slide, uh, first of all, Nick, that'd be great. So do you want to just talk us through that one more time, Judith? Great. Yes, I will. So Sound and Music Summer School doesn't have the dates on it. That was remiss of me. So it's the 1st to the 7th of August. Um, you will apply online, soundandmusic.org slash learn slash summer school. The deadline is the 6th of April. Um, and if you've got any questions, then get in touch. It's education at soundandmusic.org. So later on, we're going to ask Nick to join us because Nick's actually been involved in both summer schools. So it's always nice to hear from the perspective of other people what it's like to be in that hub of a week. We've talked a lot about this, about it's a bubble and it's a very special bubble. It's very rare that people have that bubble moment in life. I know we're all in bubbles at the moment, so it's kind of a <laughs> weird analogy, but you know, that way you can actually go away and concentrate wholly on one thing for a week and meet other people that are sort of that engaged and that intense and not thinking about anything else but that. And it's a really formative week, isn't it? It certainly is. And, and you know, like every organisation, we do evaluation forms and things afterwards, but we get fun, we get such amazing messages. People write such amazing things in their feedback and they you, you get people saying, I didn't realise that I was a composer and I now know I want to be a composer. I'm not going to do English now. I'm, <laughs> um, and I didn't know my music could sound so good when it's performed by professional musicians. Um, I, and actually, it's, it's worth saying that when you come and write your piece, you are writing it so that it's performed by professionals um, who will just, yeah, who can feed into that process and you can hear what it sounds like and they can help you change it if you don't like it and so on. So that's a really important part of the process. And it seems to be the, the one of the main things that people enjoy. I mean, obviously, our other two guests can confirm or otherwise that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's obviously a really sort of um, formative week for a lot of people. And just to reiterate, that, so as Dexter, you know, they're all session players. They've all got their own ensembles. They're all quite a few of them award winning. So um, Laura's actually not going to join us this year. But historically, Laura Jurd has been with us every year on trumpet. Uh, Sam Brasher's on alto saxophone. And then last year, I think James Alsop stepped in because of uh, some health reasons. I couldn't play the baritone. And then again, different health reasons because of COVID. So we had Mick Foster on baritone this year. But then the rhythm section for the last couple of years has always been Tom Houston on piano, who will be joining me as one of the main co-tutors. And then um, we've got Katie Patterson on drums. We've got Matt Ridley on bass. And you get time with all of those so that they look at your parts sort of on the Wednesday, start to help you. What, one of the biggest questions is, how do I write for drums? And actually, it's, well, don't overwrite. Keep it simple. And we show you how to communicate the ideas. Uh, and then just also this gone, the summer school just gone. So 2020, because we, everybody else was online, but we actually went into Air Studios. Might you explain who we recorded with and what happened there? Yeah. Yes. I mean, it was so, it was so interesting having, we all had to work online for obvious reasons last summer. Um, but the problem of how to bring together a jazz piece with improvised sections and so on was just so um the idea of trying to solve that through technology when the whole spirit of jazz is that people are in the same room and, and you know, bouncing off each other. Um, so the best solution in the end ended up being that the sextet actually went to um, Air Studios and worked with the most amazing engineer called Olga. I've forgotten her surname now, but she oh, did yeah. such a beautiful job. Um, and people yeah. will know oh, the fact that she's... Um, She's actually the engineer on The Crown, so you'll have heard her work there. And also she works a lot with Coldplay. Whenever Coldplay record an album, she's the engineer that they get into the studio. So I think they've got a private studio, but they still bring Olga in to record for them. So, 
yeah and she was amazing that was great for the young musicians because they got an authentic recording session with her online as we recorded the pieces and it's that lovely thing of everybody's eyes popping out of their heads and like you say going i never had any idea my music was going to sound that good and i think that's one of the things about you young composers is if you've got um young musicians who are still developing as players playing your music you often think it's sounding weak because of your writing and there is that correlation between you know if you're going to write well you do need musicians that play it to that level so mm -hmm. a really great go-to place so one of the musicians that we worked with online was Safi and we're going to welcome Safi to join us and come and talk to us about her piece and after that we're going to actually hear it I think you sent in the link so why don't you uh, introduce Safi and because you also I think the piece itself got more mileage than beyond the Sound of Music Summer School. It did okay so I have great pleasure in introducing Safi who's here. Um, Safi came to the Sound of Music Summer School and was in the jazz group last August so she did the online project um, and wrote the most fantastic piece that was recorded at Air Studios and actually we um, we did a little collaboration with Music for Youth, who are the people who do the National Festival of Music and they do the school's prom, um, which obviously, again, COVID, times of COVID, it couldn't happen. So they they had a sort of online project and we chose Safi's as one of the five pieces from the summer school that got kind of featured on their video wall. Um, so, yeah, so it's been travelling further afield. Um, so well done, Safi. Hello, Safi. It's lovely to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. Really good, yeah. So we're all still in lockdown. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Because we all thought within a few months we'd be out. So it's kind of, oh, we're still in it. But I see there is light at the end of the tunnel. I'm wondering, first of all, before you met us all online on summer, on the Sound of Music Summer School, what you were doing compositionally beforehand? So what was it that inspired you to apply for the summer school? Um, so I kind of about a year before um, doing the summer school, I'd gotten into sort of writing my own stuff. And it's it's quite it's something that's quite intimidating when you've never done it before, because you feel quite a lot of pressure to, you know, to be like really good on your first go. But it is sort of a trial and improvement thing. So I'd started getting into it um, and my dad and I were kind of working through using software and things like Logic Pro, GarageBand. Um, and I was sort of developing my skills more and I was kind of um bringing in some friends and doing some collaborative work and stuff like that so it was really great but um I think what I wanted was to to kind of try writing for people beyond myself because it's very easy to when you're writing your own thing and recording it yourself it's very easy to kind of fall into the trap of getting stuck in your own ideas um and I sort of wanted to branch out and it's like especially with the jazz writing as well which is something I hadn't really had a lot of um kind of education in um so I, I when I heard about the course I was thinking oh my goodness like this you know this is my chance to actually get you know kind of get some help and learn and have an experience with people who have been doing this for longer um people who can kind of give me their input and stuff like that so it was yeah really to broaden my horizons um and have a go at you know writing for other people um aren't just me yeah and also, um, I think we forgot to mention, Judith, that if somebody is in a, a group and then reapplies the following year, they'll be put in a different uh, group. So if Safi were to re reapply or anybody that had worked with us last year wanted to reapply, they wouldn't automatically be put in the jazz group. Not automatically. I mean, we, we'd normally say that, you know, variety is the spice of life and it's good to explore lots of different kinds. But I think I think actually, especially with jazz, we have we have had people who sort of particularly say, oh, but I'm really a jazz composer. And, and people do come back to the jazz group, perhaps more than other groups, actually. Well, that's interesting to hear. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. So, Safi, how did it compare? <laughs> That's quite nice. I quite like that. <laughs> Safi, how did it feel to be writing? What when you, day one when you walked in and we explained what the sex step we I think we introduced you to some of the instrumentalists and we looked at the instruments. Was that was it new to you what we were talking about, or had you sort of were you familiar with the instruments that you were going to be writing for? Um, yeah, I think the like, instrument wise, I was feeling pretty confident. You know, I've kind of been. Um, I've done quite a bit of playing in jazz ensembles and um, I play saxophone and clarinet myself so I was sort of and piano so I was sort of able to kind of um, like empathize with those 
players. Um, I think the the main thing for me that was very new but very exciting was the sort of the introduction to jazz theory. I think that's a massive thing that quite a lot of it's it's a, such a massive realm, and I think it's quite when you're sort of starting out on it, you don't really know where to begin because there are all these sort of godly figures that seem to know everything. But I think it was a really good and like smooth introduction and I didn't feel intimidated or anything like it was like a really good breakdown and like lots of listening lots of I think focus on sound which was really really valuable and you know we were listening to lots of things we were even having demonstrations from some of the uh, musicians and I think that was really like that interactive element was really really good for me um, because again it stops you sort of using like software instruments or kind of just writing on paper it really gets you like engaging with what you're actually making yeah and once you sort of we looked at that, the first two days, particularly, there's lots of intensive listening and, and looking at the harmony and how, what what that notation means. So there's it's quite a lot of where we present things, but then from then on, there's lots of time within the week to to get writing. Because if we're meeting on Sunday, it needs to be finished by Wednesday evening. So when can you remember that first moment uh, when you then went? Did you go with a piece of manuscript or did you have Sibelius open or how did you actually start your piece? Um, I think I actually started it through Logic um, because at my at home I have like an electric piano which I was plugging into my laptop and I'll sort of be messing around on it and it started off as like a, a voice note on my phone I remember I was like I think I just had an epitome and it just like um, it really you know I it just I hummed it into my phone and then I sat at the piano and kind of like banged it out um, and yeah, so it started off like that. And I think I got quite far with it on Logic, but obviously the bit that I haven't done so much of in, in a lot of my composition was the notation part. So I think um, I then transferred it over to Sibelius um, and was writing then. And I hadn't had a lot of experience in school writing. Um, so it was really, really good to, you know, to kind of get into that. It was a bit scary at first because obviously it's sort of a slower process than my rapid kind of like whacking loops into Logic and things like that. But it was a once I'd kind of gotten into it I was enjoying it and you know seeing it come before you um being able to kind of visualize the piece as a whole um yeah that was really good and the nice thing is that you've got uh, it's an accumulative over the week so first of all it's myself and Tom but then more and put people join and you actually have the trumpet and the alto the first day and then they come back midweek and then the drummer and the bass player and we're all there Wednesday evening so so there's the opportunity to actually go and ask questions isn't there which is great and I'm sure having Tom there who's a great jazz pianist sort of sit down and actually run ideas by him I, was that helpful to say I, I think this is how I would notate the harmony that goes with this melody or this counter melody yeah I was going to say um the working alongside the musicians was I think one of my favorite bits about the whole thing it's sort of what I tell any music teachers or anyone I talk to about um this because I think that's not an opportunity that everyone gets to experience you know a lot of composition especially at school if you're studying a level or GCSE it's very sort of self-driven and you're, you know, you're working with MIDI instruments, not real sound. But I think having them as a support system was really, really effective. And like having advice from, you know, like, for example, I think the bass and drums, again, that's kind of if you're not a bass player or a drum player, you're quite scared to write for them. But I think having them come in and say, OK, I would write it like this. Oh, or how do you want this? I think it helps you, especially like to, to kind of round and define your ideas and to be... Um, a lot clearer with you know how you're trying to communicate with other musicians um which obviously is a big thing because in reality if you know you were giving a piece to a live group and they didn't have a lot of time to rehearse or something you obviously need to be as clear as possible um so yeah having them go alongside me was really good and just hearing their little tips and tricks and things like that really sort of made it for me yeah the, once we finish the piece Wednesday when we're doing the rehearsal uh, it's we do then by then things do need to be quite clear don't you like the parts like you say you don't want to be spending your rehearsal time explaining the parts you want to be using your rehearsal time to actually try out the music to see if it works and and then any alternatives that you want to ask or any advice you'd get so we need to see the wood for the trees even though there are those moments where we're inviting people to contribute whether you know the rhythm section interpret what's happening or the soloist is playing we want everyone to be really clear about what the context is. So, yeah, that clarity of part. I'm just wondering, Judith, when you go out and do the outreach work, I think um, some of the things that you've been doing in schools, you've been taking other musicians with you to do exactly there what Safi was talking about, to do, so that they have the opportunity to write for professional players. 
Yeah, I don't. We don't really work in schools because we, we we train the teachers to do it themselves. Oh, wow. um, but yeah, we've got a we've got a sort of out of school project called Go Compose, which is a sort of mini version of the summer school, really. And yeah, there's a composer with some live musicians who yeah who goes a team, so that people can have that experience of working with yeah really good players. We also remind the youngsters, though, like, for example, suddenly they go, oh, well, that person can play harmonics, so we're going to have a, a, a top A of, on the saxophone side. No, no, the, the comfortable range is the F sharp, and you want your mates and your colleagues, your peers to play when you go home as well. So don't overstretch everybody because you want to make it obtainable. So I remember you, sell, you set yourself a task, Safi, when you wrote your piece. I think you were quite mindful of wanting to try and experiment. If You set yourself a task to see if it was possible. And it was about contrasting sections using sort of a light motif that you took through the whole piece. Might you talk us through that? And then I think it'd be wonderful if we actually hear it. Yeah, so I think um, when I was kind of having that first initial burst of ideas, I think I started with a bass line um, and I was very fond of it. Um, and I, but I couldn't actually decide on sort of what groove I was trying to go for. And I ended up with two sort of versions of it, like on audio recording on my phone. Um, and I just couldn't pick. And I thought, you know what, maybe I should just try and sort of see if I can fuse them um, in, because they were both quite bright and upbeat. And I was just thinking, yeah, I'm going to see how, if I can get them to work together. And it's kind of a challenge I'd never done before, because I guess, I was sort of in my earlier stages of composition. So a lot of the things I've been doing were kind of like more repetitive, maybe like repeated chord progressions and loops and stuff. So I was like, okay, I really want to practice sort of doing like a large structure piece that has, that accounts for some kind of change. And also just because I, I felt quite a personal connection to both of the styles, um, especially for me, um, as you'll hear, um, the, one of the sections has a sort of, um, bossa nova slash funk fusion feel to it and I think that's very reflective of what I've grown up on which are my parents being very fond of funk and salsa and kind of yeah mixing all of that together with again sort of my love for like the um, typical jazz sound like the swing feel um, yeah so I kind of just wanted to bring all of my passion for the you know for the actual genre and just put it into one especially because you know we've heard we heard such a a brilliant range of things as well I kind of wanted to bring it all in and it just yeah it just kind of exploded into those two contrasting sections before we go in here I think you've just raised something that's really important that I'd like to bring Judith back in on which is to that you know it's very much about the young musician and what they've already been doing and what their interests already are isn't it and to be bringing that to the mix definitely yeah um we really don't do a sort of you must do it like this this is how composition happens properly. Um, this is my style and you will copy it. We, it's the other, the other way around. Let's start with what people are into and what people know and, and work from there. So without further ado, I think it'd be wonderful if Nick, if you're good to go, let's hear Safi's wonderful piece. Would you like to introduce it for us, Safi, before we play it? Yeah, so the piece itself is called Forecast um, and my reason for naming it that was just because obviously it was mid in the middle of the pandemic the year was kind of fluctuating no one really knew what was going on um a lot of change and unexpected things had happened and I sort of wanted to reflect some change that had been good for once and positive change hence the like the sort of contrasting sections we talked about so yeah I sort of just wanted to bring a smile to people's faces and let them if not fear change for once um mm -hmm. and yeah have a kind of nice surprise rather than fear and unexpected kind of tension so yeah that's forecast brilliant over to you nick
again. Well done, Safi. That's brilliant. And that was Mick Foster on, on the baritone solo there. So it was uh, Laura Jurd on trumpet, Sam Brasher on alto saxophone, and then Mick Foster taking the baritone solo there. And then Tom Hewson on piano, Matt Ridley on bass, and Katie Patterson on drums. And uh, apart from Laura, that'll be the same team with us again. I'll be playing baritone again this year. So uh, that'll be the same team. So... But come back and join us, Judith and Safi, and we're going to welcome uh, a member of the summer school, Sound and Music Summer School, that was with us the previous year when we were in person. So, Scotty Thompson, come and join us. How are you doing? Hi. Nice to see you. And um, we had the we had a double whammy that year because then you you went on to do the NYJC Summer School later on that month, which was yeah, great. Yeah, the busy time, two summer schools in about three weeks. So it was amazing, though. <laughs> And did you actually get the opportunity to play your sextet with MYJC? Did you bring it along and was there the opportunity to play it? I don't think we managed to play it in the end. Um, I have actually played it more recently, though, in a sort of smaller group setting. Oh, but tell us about it, that, because I'm sure Judith would love to hear, and Safi as well. Um, yeah, so I got together a trio, well, originally a quartet, but it ended up being a trio, um, for the EFG London Jazz Festival um, as part of, of Jazz New Blood. And I just had to write a few, like a set of uh, original tunes. And I thought I might as well use one of the, the ones that I've written for Sound and Music. I don't think we ended up recording it in the end, but um, yeah. So it was cool to revive that piece that had um, kind of started the, the journey for me for jazz composition. So then we'll go backwards, I think, on this one, just to say, first of all, where is it? Where are you now? Because you've actually now gone to study at a conservatoire. Where are you? Yeah, I'm at the Royal, Academy, uh, the Royal Academy of Music. I'm in my first year now. And when we met two years ago, how sure did you feel at that point about what you wanted to do with your future? Um, I wasn't really sure, to be honest, and was pretty intimidated to even apply to some of these conservatoires. I remember um, actually at NYJC, my group, um, everyone saying where they were going and pretty much everyone other than me and one other person were saying they were off to either Academy or Guildhall or Trinity. And that felt kind of terrifying at the time. Um, so it's pretty surreal now being there, but those experiences definitely helped me decide that, yeah, that was what I wanted to go into. So it was a really important summer, that summer to sort of say, yeah, this is definitely mm. where I want to be as a composer and a jazz musician. Do you call yourself a jazz composer or do you call yourself a composer? Mm. I like to call myself a composer because I compose in a lot of other styles as well. I do quite a bit of contemporary classical stuff as well. as mm -hmm. so Obviously, I'm a jazz musician, but... Um, yeah, composed in a variety of styles. Can you tell us a bit about that breadth of writing, the sort of things that you've written? Yeah, so I I actually was told to apply for Sound and Music by my composition teacher at college, who um, is an incredible teacher, but he's um, very much on, on the class, uh, contemporary classical side of things. So I was having one-to-one -one lessons with him through the Hampshire Music Service, and he taught me about all of that sort of all of that sort of stuff, and um, applied for some uh, competitions, and did a few awards, and um, so yeah, I've been able to have a few pieces performed in that style as well as jazz, which is really cool. And and now at the moment, because it can be very all-consuming, you know, being at the academy, the practice, amount of practice, playing in other people's mm. bands. I should imagine a lot of people are asking you to be in their band and then keeping the composing going as well. So uh, do you get the opportunity to do any non-jazz composition at the moment or is it, do you find that everything at the moment just as things are, that you're sort of tending to be more jazz based? Yeah, um, non-jazz, you kind of have to do it in your own time. I mean, I try and make time for composition of any, any sorts like recently I've been trying to set myself half an hour every day just to write something mm, regardless of style just because to, to keep that sort of muscle alive because I think it is something that you have to exercise regularly just being able to compose and get stuff out quickly even if you're not super satisfied with it so when I'm doing that that can be in a variety of styles not just jazz but obviously it is it's easy to fall into 
the sort of trap of just doing jazz stuff when that's all you're doing at college but all of yeah. this sort of interrelated it's all feeding in so the sound world that you play in and it probably start to appear in some of your improvising that you're starting to broaden the palette like you are with mm. these exercises and also pete churchill was with us two weeks ago and uh, he mm. does a lot of composition at the academy as well doesn't he so there's yeah uh, it's very it's an integral part of the course yeah he's brilliant i mean we had a lesson with him literally this morning um and i just leave all of his sessions feeling so inspired and like there's all this stuff that I need to go and look at, but it's really exciting him teaching us. And yeah, it's a big part of the course. We have um, four composition projects every year and um, we have lessons on it. And then we write, it's all handwritten in first year, which is really cool. And then there are play days, um, well, they call them play days, which is, we just have to read the charts and play everyone's tunes and yeah, get feedback and oh, yeah, seeing great. how it sounds. Which is really cool. And one of the things, and then Judith, I'd uh, be interested to get your take on this. I think Scotty's touched on something which might not be obvious, so it might be quite good just to raise it as a comment and to talk about it. But is that, you know, uh, in passing, we're sensing that there are other one or two other musicians that there are peers that they've known about and been, but by doing these summer schools, we're talking about actually meeting youngsters on a national scale so that you can really contextualize yourself and that, that assurance of actually, I do think I want to do this because they've met their peers and they've seen where they kind of fit. And there are others that are feeling a bit more confident about they want to go into the profession. It's actually, I think just with wherever I am now or a bit of extra work, I do see now I, I'm gaining the confidence to think, no, I want to go that path as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think I think there's a, a couple of things there. Um, there's somebody called Georgia Denham who came to Sound Music Summer School a while ago, perhaps 2015, about that time. Um, and she's actually somebody who she went to Birmingham Conservatoire and then to do composition. And it, she was one of those who sort of came because she liked music, but then realised that composing was actually the bit of music that she liked the most. Um, so she went to Birmingham Conservatoire as a musician. But she and she's now on the Sound of Music um, New Voices scheme, which is like the, you know, what it says on the box. It's it's the next generation of contemporary composers um, that we're nurturing as adults. Um, and she said to me recently, um, she said, oh, God, that, you know, one of the most important things that I got out of the summer school, obviously, I got some great tuition and I developed as a composer. But it actually was talking to some, she sort of said, my parents knew nothing about the music education system. And I talked, I shared a bedroom with this girl who knew all about applying for conservatoire. She knew about the auditions and what you had to do. And she knew the right things you had to say because she had a music teacher who told her. And it was that sort of, and, and you know, she wouldn't have realised that conservatoire was a thing that she could have even, you know, a bit like Scotty was saying, well, it was a bit intimidating, but you met those people and they gave you the confidence because you could see that you were all equals. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a very uneven picture and some people have some people live in the right part of the country and can go to junior junior academy or or something and and or you might live miles away and you can't access that kind of education or your your future school doesn't really know or you know um so actually coming to coming to something like sound and music or nyjc you're you're with other young people and also tutors who know that system and who can support you I remember when, you were, um, when we were in, at the East Anglia University running the uh, NYJC summer school and I suddenly realised that some of the youngsters who'd come on their own saw friendship groups and they just thought that these friendship groups like whirlpools had formed within a few hours of arrival and thinking, well, why aren't I part of that? And not realising some of them are going to specialist schools. Like you say, not everybody knows about all the different opportunities are there. So we're really mindful of making sure that those little whirlpools of pre-existing friendships don't stay solid and fixed so that everybody's on the same footing. And also to encourage everyone, if they know people, to actually look out and see who they don't know and really help focus so that we all, all feel that we're all in it together. I'm thinking, Safi, do, does this ring true, what we're talking about here? Yeah, um, I mean, I've been to a course twice, actually, in Harrogate, um, and it was a saxophone course rub, run by Rob Buckland um, and some of his fellow tutors, um, and I loved it. But obviously, um, I because I've been doing clarinet for a lot longer than I've been doing saxophone, so it was quite new for me, and I was quite 
I was excited, but I was obviously quite nervous. I didn't know anyone and it was very far up north. Um, and yeah, so on the first day, it's kind of like, uh, you're quite scared and you see people talking who you know have done it for the past three years. And obviously, um, I mean, this one was really lovely because I think the age range was probably like 11 to, there was actually a 98 year old baritone player who <laughs> came along twice on both times. Um, yeah, and so I think it was nice to have such a range, but obviously, um, all of the teenagers, some of them would be sort of bound together and you'd be a bit scared to talk to them. But I think that kind of fear of first getting there, um, it just disappeared really. Like, and I think by, you know, the next couple of days, especially because it was residential, you just felt really close to the people. And I'm still in touch with um, quite a few people from these courses. And um, I've even done a couple of collaborative music things with two of them. So it's been really great. So it's it is scary at first, but it just, that kind of fear dissipates and it's really, yeah, a welcoming environment. And I think also sometimes teasing, sort of school teasing is because some people aren't actually into what you're into and they're teasing you because of your interest, but because it's a shared interest that soon goes away. They've got that vested interest, haven't they? Everybody wants to achieve the same thing. So I'm thinking it'd be lovely to come back in a moment and talk a little bit more, but Scotty, I wondered if you might uh, introduce your piece that you wrote two summer schools ago and maybe if there's anything particular about it that you we often talk about getting the most maximum out of the minimum that's sort of the mantra that I encourage all the youngsters I think I might have to get a t-shirt printed for the 15th birthday definitely certainly for the 13th this year so Scotty what what was your getting the maximum out of the minimum might you talk us through your piece just if there are any sort of um, landmarks to look out for yeah sure so this piece is called Ground Up, and I think it's just called that because I started literally from the ground up with a bass line um, and maybe a, a few piano chords. And yeah, it kind of evolved from that into this melody, um, which then shifts up just like a minor third, I think. So that's kind of, yeah, again, using the same theme, but just using it to take it to a new place. And then there's a B section where it opens up a bit and gets a bit more modal. I can't remember entirely because it's been a long time <laughs> since I've probably heard this. But um, yeah, and I mean, some of the some of the parts were inspired by um, some of the tutors that came and gave me advice, uh, which is really amazing. Um, you know, Tom Hewson and Chris Montague, the guitarist as well, who's gave me some really, really great um, advice on the piece. And yeah, so it's all a kind of combination of those things, but yeah, that's about it. So, yeah, the main landmarks is that it's starting with the bass and then also that you suddenly at one point thought, I want some contrast here. So the B section and how do yeah, that? The B section is just a kind of contrast um, where the horns open up. I can't really remember. I think they're playing in unison in A and then they kind of open up into these more quarter voice things at B. So brilliant. Yeah. And people that are watching, and also for the, for you guys, uh, we did last week. We did a conversation with Christine Jensen from. Uh, she was a summer school tutor a couple of years ago. She's going to be back for our fifteenth birthday, and she's based in Canada. And um, and Christine, there's a piece that we do teach with the Castle Mountain. You know, all, both of you will have done that piece with me as part of what we do with the, the early days of looking at repertoire. And that piece I particularly choose because it starts from the bass and it was her way of sort of exploring the bass and development of the bass and then building on it. So um, if you... I was going to say Safi and Scotty if you want to go and watch that because but then I realised you've already done that piece because we did it at the Sound Music Summer School but it might be quite nice for you to go and see what she says about it it's all about a walk and it's really interesting so uh, but for now everybody and I would urge everybody to go and listen to it and uh, Judith we're actually going to bring that little video to the Sound of Music Summer School now so to go with the spell book we've got some little videos that we're making but for now uh, Scotty your piece uh, and Nick is going to press play. So see you all in a minute. We're all going to take ourselves off video so that you get the full Monty.
Scotty that just reminded me as I applauded at the end I think it was either this it was last year it was the year of Scotty wasn't it when I suddenly clapped in the gap about four bars before the end I forgot it was a false ending <laughs> so uh, Safi and Scotty I was wondering what did it feel like because both those recordings we've heard were the recording sessions so the sort of Friday after Friday daytime so then in the evening your pieces then went on to be played and that was then suddenly in front of an audience with the parents are there as well. You've got the band playing, opening things up a little bit, stretching out, as we say, just to don't necessarily need to just do a fixed number of repeats. You don't want to jeopardise if somebody's going to overshoot or, or pay one extra repeat while everyone else goes off into the distance. So that's why we're quite prescriptive about the recording, but you can afford to, to take those risks a bit more in performance because, you know, we, we can visually indicate if it's we're going to keep going around or moving on so how did it feel to then have all your peers hearing your pieces for the first time rapturous applause from the audience and everybody playing their hearts out how was that for you first of all Safi um yeah it was really nice I think is um towards the end it can be quite stressful you know you're kind of like rapidly finishing up the pieces and kind of making sure everything's together so you've you sort of slipped into the trap of being more sort of like I know you're in a kind of organizer's headspace and you're thinking oh gosh have I got it all in and you I think having that performance really helps you to sit back and listen to it and feel proud of yourself which I think is a massive thing um sort of allowing yourself to to step back and look at what you've done you know without kind of being really like nitpicky and things like that so I think it was it was really nice and it kind of 
it sort of de-stressed anything and like and I think it was a really nice end um and yeah to hear people you know just really like what you've made it's a really special thing I think because obviously music and composition is a very subjective thing and just you know it's, it's a very very lovely thing knowing that none of the 7.6 billion other people on earth have conceived what you have so I think you know having appreciation for that is really good and it also lets you be proud of yourself which is a massive part of growing as a composer yeah and, and Judith uh, Safi's just touched on something that the parents come rushing up afterwards because they've got the same experience as the youngsters of the they've never heard the young musicians compositions played by professionals often before so it's something they often say is that we might before we invite Scotty to say what it felt like to have his piece performed live is there anything that you might like to say as a follow-on to, to what I've just said I think really just to en endorse what you've said I mean yeah par parents are always, always so excited and proud at, at the end of the performances and and I think you know and often parents are really generous actually they'll say they won't say oh my my child was the best they'll just say what an amazingly talented group of people um which obviously is is true um and yeah and the con you know having a concert of you know 15 world premieres like that is just amazing and really exciting that's a good point 75 <laughs> premieres every year it's a lot of premieres <laughs> Scotty, how did it feel having your piece performed live and having the response of the audience? Oh, it's amazing. Um, it was, yeah, it's one thing hearing it recorded and then in front of all your peers who are all being super supportive and and also just hearing the musicians let loose. Um, I think I remember Tom on piano, he took a pretty incredible piano solo of the recording. He just really let loose and went crazy which um I feel like people are often a bit more scared to do in a recording scenario but um but yeah it was amazing I think it was probably the first time I'd ever heard any of my jazz compositions performed by mm. especially by professional musicians but I don't even I think it might have been by anyone you know so it was a first for me which is amazing so have things moved forward for both of you since doing the summer school? Safi, what's happened? And then Scotty, we'd love you to hear just as we round off. What how are you know, how are things now compositionally and what are you work both working on? Where do you see it all fitting in your journey of creativity? Safi. Um yeah, it was a really good sort of gateway and kind of a lovely confidence booster, I think, as well, like with it being a, a large scale project, um, you know, kind of lifting me from my usual sort of composing on my own like laptop with my own resource so I think it really kind of opened up my like my ear and my open-mindedness towards composition and like combining it with actual like sort of playing in real life ensembles and things so when I went to um because I then in September went to a new sixth form um so I'm in year 12 um and that it was a completely new music scene but I sort of felt like I could go in with some confidence and I showed my teachers my piece and they said they really liked it and you know like we have a jazz collective at my school now that I'm a part of and you know it's quite nice to be that we all kind of share ideas and throw in anything we want to play so I can now be like oh you know do you guys want to try this and I think it's it's it was really good bridging between my sort of playing life um instrumentally and then obviously my sort of home composition and home studio life so it's really good bridging of those two and I think showing it to people has made me yeah, I feel quite proud, but quite like excited to show them. And it's, I've had, you know, positive like response from it. And I think, yeah, so it was really good um, to have done that before going into my new school. Yeah. And where do you see composition in your future? Um, I think it's something I, I hope to be doing all the time, forever, you know, no matter what I, because I'm sort of in between where, you know, trying to decide where I'm going and things like that um, with further, further study. But it's I know for a fact it's always going to be with me I'm always going to be sort of scribbling down little bits or humming into my phone or some kind of thing to keep it going um yeah and I'm working on some projects with some friends and other musicians um working quite a lot at a time but I think that's quite good because it means I don't get bored or stuck in one genre one style I kind of move around and just yeah just a reflection of what kind of comes out of me and what I'm feeling and things like that. So it's definitely going to be with me forever. Um, yeah. I think that's something Judith and I have noticed over the sort of the last 10, 15 years, just 
our involvement in the music industry and it's you know not just as educators but also wider um, involvement that everything's much more genre fluid people are, are not wanting to pigeonhole as much what do you might you say anything about that Judith before we pass on to Scotty yeah I think that's totally absolutely true and we see that um, not only sort of in the education work we do at Sound and Music but also the artist development work and people are working cross genre cross culture cross media you know, it might be video and sound, it might be um, sound with, you know, sounds made from things. Um, yeah, really, really um, boundary breaking and exciting. So Scotty, uh, we're going to sign off before uh, in a minute with one of your pieces. But um, I wondered, first of all, and I'll bring Nick in between finishing this conversation and hearing your piece. Um, but I'm wondering, first of all, where where did you then go after the summer school sort of compositionally? What what happened next? Um, yeah, I mean, I carried on doing loads of composition, obviously, in many different contexts, because I think I was going into year 13. So I would have been doing composition for A-levels and everything, but also, um, yeah, in a jazz context, still doing classical stuff. Um, I've... Uh, not only have I been writing for my own band, which is the one that you'll hear in a sec, but also doing stuff. I play a lot with Emma Ravitch, um, who's mm -hmm. also my year at Academy, and um, she she composes loads. So, like, we kind of share compositions and sort of um, workshop those. And we've done quite a few gigs with yeah her originals. So that's been really cool and just hearing my music workshops in, in real time, um, not only with her band, but of course, as part of the course at Academy. Um, and yeah, it's just become a kind of integral part of my life at this point, which is great. I think most of, if not all of the year are X on NYJC. Yeah, it's insane. I think everyone except one person I met on NYJC, which <laughs> is pretty mental. And the reason that I was particularly asking was because um, you are improvising within the context of your own composition so you've got that advantage of because you were working the, on the piece as you wrote it you know every nook and cranny so does that influence the way you improvise within your own music yeah I think so it's yeah it's amazing as a jazz musician being able to write stuff but knowing that you can then improvise over it because you and you know the piece better than anyone because you wrote it from the from the beginning so it's yeah, it's great. And sometimes trying to use some of the information from the, the piece into your improvisations. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, if you use the composition and then exploit it through your improvisation. Very good. I like that. He's making the maximum out of the minimum. <laughs> Nick, come and join us as we sign off and then we're going to hear Scotty's piece. So what's it feel like reconnecting? It's the first time that you've met, Safi, because uh, you weren't doing Sound and Music this summer. So um, how has it been listening to, hearing about, in, being introduced to and hearing Safi's music? Really lovely. Like, what a lovely piece as well. Um, and, and to think just written in a week um, or, 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 or over that period of time, um, just phenomenal to, to get such kind of contextualised ideas together. Um, really amazing. And it brought back a lot of kind of things that I'd forgotten about, about my kind of journey and musical journey and, and that first time hearing professional musicians playing um, playing your music like I remember working with BCMG um, and I, I even I could even play you right now what I wrote for them back when I was about 10 because of because the experience was was so powerful um, so you know it's it's a really special thing um, that having professional musicians and that opportunity to do so. I think that's important about the people that we booked Judith for both of the courses is that 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 ability to reconnect with their own early muse and remembering what it was like to be so there's great empathy and encouragement and also in, inquisitiveness shared inquisitiveness and that joyousness of oh my gosh look what this young musician's created in the space of a week Ooh. yes definitely and um yeah i think for a lot of the tutors working on the course it's it's a highlight of their year you know it's a time definitely. time to sort of yeah be really creative and and supportive of, of the next generation 
So we're all of us are really keen to uh, support all of young musicians that are interested in both of the programmes. And so because of that, we're, we both take bursaries really seriously and we put a lot of effort. The organisations put a lot of effort because we don't want there to be any barriers. It would break our hearts. Genuinely, we'd break our hearts if we heard of a young musician not engaging with something that they themselves love and want to pursue because of financial barriers. So. Nick, might you explain how we manage that? I know uh, we've already touched on uh, the Sound of Music Bursary Scheme. And so, Nick, what are we doing to raise a bit of money? Because with COVID, I'm sure you found the same, Judith, um, a lot of parents have been hard hit. And so we've actually had more applications in 2020 than we did ever before for bursaries because of that side of things. So, Nick, how do, we, um, how do you donate to NYJC? So if you'd like to support NYJC in its commitment to making our work accessible to all musicians, no matter what their background, um, please head to nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash donate. Um, that will take you to a link where we've got our £15,000 uh, for 15 years of NYJC campaign going. And we'll really appreciate your support in, in getting us to that target. So I'm thrilled to announce that we were very successful with some funding that we um, wrote a funding application. So we've got money to have 15 ambassadors to train 15 alumni and to commission some new projects with that. So the ambassadors, we become members of the um, faculty. So we train them to become educators, but we're also because of our 15th birthday. So we had confirmation on Monday and Tuesday. So that's really exciting. I think that deserves a big whoop whoop from everybody. So you see... People out there do want to support us, and we know that because that's the only way we've managed to be where we are. We know that there's lots of love and support for what we do and inquisitiveness about what we're doing. So how do people find out about what we're doing, Nick? What's the fast track? We have a bi-monthly newsletter, um, which is due to go out next week. So now is the time to sign up if you want to hear the latest NYJC news. And to do so, uh, just head to nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash sign up. And we've got lots of our partners' information about that. So Sound and Music link is in the newsletter. We've got various other people. I think, um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I've been so much enjoying about composition, but there's lots of different... Can you remember a couple of the other things that we've popped in there? There is some uh, youth music uh, news in there as well and some other partners. Um, Awards for young musicians as well. Yes, how you can yes that's the some Support, because often people need instruments, you know, for example, we've often had people do the summer school trumpet player saying, oh, I could really do with a flugel at this level or, I, you know, I play out tenor saxophone, I could do with an out, a soprano, but I just, you know, I haven't got the finances. And so awards for young musicians have supported a lot of the young musicians that we work with. So I would love to go on forever and ever. This is such a great conversation, Judith. How's it been reconnecting with everybody? Stick around, Nick. Yeah, it's been really lovely um enjoyed it very much thank you for thank you for having me well looking forward to seeing you in person in august as well well i've had the uh, vaccine by then the second one so i'll be bulletproof having had it twice so uh, that's been nice in person scotty how's it been reconnecting with everybody it's been amazing yeah thank you so much for having me um yeah it's been great just to talk about my experience and hear about what everyone else has been up to it's been fantastic for us as well so we're really and in a minute we're going to ask you to introduce your piece but um it's been really lovely to reconnect it is two, 18 months two years i've lost track of where we are 18 months since we last saw each other and uh, and also um we had i think imogen has been singing she's on the course as well imogen churchill's been in already and done some she sang a piece with uh, nikki isles very early on in our early days and then uh Safi, how's it feel to have reconnected with Sound of Music and to have met NYJC? Really, really good. I mean, it, it, that course really meant a lot to me and I think it really opened out my sort of confidence and, and ideas about composition. And yeah, I'm just really happy to talk to musicians again and kind of get into the flow of it. Yeah, so I'm really grateful. Thank you for having me. You're really welcome. And, it's, and I think the nice thing about what we all do when we work together is that we're all in it together so we you know it's really great to see the journeys that you'll take us on and I'm really looking forward and I know Judith feels the same and Nick really looking forward to seeing what the both of you do next year the year after and so on and whenever people say I don't know what you say to Judith when people say thank you so much my answer is you don't need to thank me now it's when I'm in a bath wheelchair and um and, and I can't drive myself to a gig anymore if you could just put a ticket on the door so that I can come and join you and maybe give me a lift once a year that's the way that's the time to be thanking us all <laughs> so 
Over to you, Scotty. We're going to introduce your piece and then we'll sign off. See, oh, next week, by the way, everybody, it's um, Jim Hart is joining us and uh, he's one of our summer school tutors. So very excited, really looking forward to talking to him. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Scotty. Thank you, Judith. Thanks, Scotty. Thanks, Safi. Thanks, Nick. See you all next week. Over to you, Scotty. Yeah, uh, this piece is called Anticipation and it's with Toby Yap on bass and Finn Janocki on drums, so enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> 